Kyle is a great example of how a Boston College education offers you a lot of opportunities. Sometimes you're ready to take them. Sometimes they get offered again and again. And sometimes um, you don't realize it until after graduation, which is true for many of us who had Catholic Jesuit educations. It's sort of something that goes on and on in our lives and has an impact for much longer that we, than we would have anticipated when we you know, said yes to our admissions office uh, offer and, and came to campus for the first time. So I was delighted when Kyle said that he would write for the magazine. And I think he was surprised. And I was kind of surprised too, because to, to tell you the truth, I had Kyle an enduring question course called Geographies of Imperialism. Some of the students are here from that class. It was tw fall of 2021. I had seen Kyle, I thought he was a great student, great guy, everyone who knows Kyle. But I haven't really seen him after that fall semester. And last year around Thanksgiving, we bumped into each other uh, at the, on the lawn, like we all do, right? Hi, how are you, how are you? And I said, Kyle, you need to come see me in my office and tell me how you're doing. And he said, okay. I'll come tomorrow. <laughs> and, and I mean that when I, when I say it, and I was really happy for him to come. And he sort of told me the story that he relates in the article and how transformative his education had been here in many ways, because we're not just interested in your, in your intellectual growth and development, although that, that is certainly why we are all here. But as a part of your education, we hope you're also sort of developing in your mind and your heart. And, Kyle certainly has a story to tell about that. I had been offered the opportunity to guest edit this ma magazine. Kyle and I had, I don't think it was random, but run into each other and he had shared this story with me. And so I reached out to him and said, would you write an article about your experience of being reflective, being attentive and being loving during your time at Boston College? And he said, yes. So, so here we are today because I think the article has a lot of value. Kyle's experience is something that we can all, I can learn from, other people, other readers can learn from. And it's wonderful that he's also still here on campus getting a graduate degree this year, that he'd be even here to have a conversation in person today. So, so thank you so much, Kyle, for saying yes and sharing your story. So going back to freshman year, I maybe knew it at the time. You said I knew it more than I recall, but you, you had struggled a little bit. Again, I think intellectually you were, you were doing really well and the material didn't seem too hard for you, but you said that you had had some sort of personal things that you were struggling with, just kind of integrating. So many freshmen have this experience, right? Coming to a new city, a new school, integrating, finding your people, settling in. So can you talk a little bit about that and, and the path it led you on? Maybe how you first started being attentive to what was going on with you in a new way. Hi, everyone. Before I get going, I just want to thank, uh, there's a lot of familiar faces in this room. It means a lot uh, for all my, my friends and different faculty that I've met to, uh, to be here right now. That's really awesome. And uh, in terms of uh, what was going on in my, my freshman year, and then I think the, the difference between being attentive and reflective, which is not totally obvious at first, is that Attentive is noticing things, and then being reflective is really trying to dive into what those things mean. I don't know. My, my freshman year, I definitely knew that I was, I was unhappy. And I think that a way to uh, think about it is that I was kind of like a noise addict, if that makes sense. So at, at BC, there's definitely times where things are really loud, at like the football games, if you're going to parties, if you're, you're hanging out with your friends. That's a loud, a loud time. And then, obviously, there's there's quieter times as well, where it's just you and you're alone, and then it's you deciding kind of how your thoughts are gonna affect you. And I noticed myself running like full sprint away from uh, those kind of moments where I could sit by myself and be reflective. Either it was on my phone, or I would, I would really like seek out like interaction to have with people instead, because it was almost like I was really scared to just kind of sit with myself. I didn't totally know why, but I remember 
there's a story that my, my friend told me that I definitely resonated with. And, and my friend was telling the story about how he was in the dining hall by himself, how he felt really like kind of uncomfortable being there by himself. And he didn't really know why. And I totally felt that. I was, it was like every time I was alone in a place where I thought I should have been social, it felt like every single eye was on me there. Yeah, and then I think part of the, the rest of the reason why I was unhappy, some people in this room know me when I was a freshman, and hopefully they can see a little bit of an arc from this, that when I came to BC, I thought I knew a lot about the world. And in terms of self-knowledge, that was a lot lower. Whereas now, I think, and I hope this comes off, I don't know if it always does, I hope that I try to bring a little more humility in terms of my knowledge about what the world is and focus, I guess, kind of the center of knowledge that I have more on myself. Because I think that that's the one thing everybody's the best expert on is their own experience and what that means. And I think that that's kind of the, a little bit of the transition to get into it a little further. Professor Shalala a lot of the time calls me, said I was a, a Marxist in her uh, <laughs> freshman year class. Not that I really knew what that meant, but, um, and I might have self-proclaimed that as well at times, but there was definitely this kind of material way that I looked at the world. And I don't know, I think we all know and have come to accept that the circumstances that we're around in the world around us really affects us as people and can really affect our moods. I mean. I know that it's, the days are gonna start getting shorter and my thoughts are gonna start getting crazier as the winter comes, and I think that's something that a lot of us notice, but how the world can affect our thoughts is something we know, but I think also the way that we perceive the world is a lot of the times a choice. And if you perceive the world in one sort of way and you choose to impose a worldview on the world, then that comes and that affects you as well. So when I had this really material mindset of things. I mean, I had heard the, the problem of evil, and I was like, all right, well, that's it for God. Like, I can't believe in that anymore. And I tried to take uh, all the mystery out of life. I don't know, a lot of things, I think, really started to become a little more dull, you know? And it was kind of a realization like that over this long, it was a long, long process of, of being attentive and being reflective, but it was the realization that I was kind of imposing a vision on the world that really made me unhappy. And then it was a choice, okay, I don't wanna be unhappy anymore, so how am I gonna change the way I look at the world? And then I'll see if maybe the world starts to uh, start affecting me in a little bit of a better way. And I don't know, I don't know how many people have read the, the article that I wrote in the C21 Resources magazine. It's on page 24 if you wanna, dog hear it for later. But I talk about this day, and actually my good friend, my good friend Zelik, who's over there, he, he showed me this one spot on campus and it was really sweet. Uh, it's called like the Huffton Garden. And then there was, there was one day that I went over there and I was like, okay, enough running from my thoughts. I'm gonna block out this chunk of time and do nothing but sit with myself. And that was it, and that's what I did. And I started doing that every Thursday afternoon after class for one semester. It was funny because I, I wanted to like document what I was thinking, so I had my little laptop and I had this, this Word document open on my laptop because I couldn't connect it to the internet while I was out there. I would just type literally every word that was in my head, just like a nice stream of consciousness. And the document got, it got pretty long. It was like 30, 35 pages. And then my laptop broke and the document was gone forever, so I don't know <laughs> what I was thinking about. But I think that the main takeaway from that experience is that it was... It was really just the, the time spent alone that was the biggest difference. And then it was like a choice to, to start to see the world in a different way. And I think that that's kind of the main reason for my faith journey at BC. Like, I don't know, I, I've definitely written a lot of papers about the Odyssey and, and the Book of Jokes, I really like that. But, um, I, I really think that my faith started as a choice, that like, okay, I'm gonna try and start doing this and see if I become happier. And then I was, and it was working, and then the, the faith became less of a choice and more of a part of me, if that makes sense. And then I think that 
I don't know. There's one line, and it's it's a little bit cringe that I wrote in my in my article, but it was I think I wrote that the world can sing, but you only have to listen to it, and I think that that was the most important kind of line, and maybe the whole thing for me in terms of my own experience is that I really just had to seek out finding God and like the sun and like the leaves and and every every part of of existence and every relationship you have. And I think that that's kind of the first step to, um, for me to, to living a happier life one. And then also one of my friends told me that he thinks I've definitely been more kind since uh, my, my transformation. And I don't know, that meant a lot because that's something that I also thought I tried to take more seriously in that moment. So I talked about the opportunities. There's a couple of elements of your article that I'd like you to talk about. One is, so we could just say, how did you choose your major, right? But I, I think there's something more to it than that. The university core curriculum, of which you had to take a number of courses, including mine, that was paired with a theologian, the core wants you to explore not only your interests, but also your gifts and your talents. And I think that's something that you've done through the core. But we also have different centers and opportunities across campus, whether it's C21 or, in your case, the Center for Student Formation, right? So do you, could you talk a bit about taking those opportunities or your journey or path through the core mm -hmm. and how that might have related to your own formation and faith journey eventually? Yeah, that's an awesome question. I'm, I'm very glad you asked it. So, so I ended up completing my undergrad in three years because of the amount of the core I was able to test out of. And I only had to take philosophy and theology classes, and I got confirmed and added a philosophy major. So that's pretty, um, <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's like 100% of the core I ended up taking really influenced my, uh, influenced my life. I wonder what Imagine happened. if you had taken more. Oh, you're going to it. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think that that's definitely really a part of the, the BC mission that's super important. The opposite is there's one school that, uh, is really high academic that has no core and you only take classes that you want. And you know, for me that sounded like, oh, that's a really good thing. Like people should only be paying for classes they want to take. And I think that, I don't know, uh, Professor Higgins' article in the um, C21 resource magazine really points this out, that you can't really explain the value of a philosophy class to a student that hasn't taken it yet because the whole point is to transform the value system that they're kind of judging things on. So if it's not the same value system that they're gonna like it for later, you can't be upfront about why they're gonna like it now. So I think that that's um, something about the core. But so now I have a new role on campus. I'm a graduate assistant um, in the Vice President of Student Affairs Office. And I've kind of seen the other side of things that I wasn't interacting with. And there's a couple like BC buzzwords that we hear a lot and that's kind of intentional and formation. Those are the two that really come to mind. And I realized in this role, from working with professional staff that are putting on these programs for these students, how much of everything that we get from BC is really intentionally formative. It's like amazing. So I'm an RA, and now I know a little bit more about the conduct process. Even, even our conduct process is formative for students. It's every single thing that like students interact with, it's the administration is really making conscious choices about it and about how that affects students. And it's in places that you would never really expect. And then in terms of the center of student formation, one of the things I learned is that the, the freshman league is called the freshman league and the, the seniors that are in it are called captains. And it's sort of ways to like get a lot of young men to join this club about reflection without making it seem like that's what they're joining at first. And I think that that definitely got me in, on the hook. And then I ended up leading that later as a senior. And that, I think, was really the first place where I was really challenged to sit with myself and dive into my thoughts. And I remember from my, my freshman year, my freshman league experience, one of the things we were talking about was uh, what values has your family kind of given to you that you really like and take care of? And this was at a time where I thought I didn't really know what my values were because I thought I could just really argue for either side for most questions. I didn't really have a finished, settled debate about which one was right. And then that day in the garden was definitely like a continuation of that. So when I, when I, this is out of order, but when I got confirmed on 
Father Penna, he was my confirmation teacher. He told us this kind of, I don't know what you would call it, but he said, uh, a mature person is like a marshmallow with a BB pellet inside of it, where on most things they're pretty flexible, but at their core, they're rigid. And he said that the maturing process is you deciding what you want your pellet to be inside the marshmallow. And it was like a really awesome analogy. If you ever met Father Penna, that's so on brand for him. Yeah, so I think that that's kind of what Center Student Formation really allowed me to do is give me a space to really explore what I didn't know, realize what I didn't know, and then go off in the world afterwards and kind of decide those core values and what they were to me and what I wanted them to be. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and it sounds like that, that transformational process of reconnecting, redefining your core values, who you are, how you want to be in the world. I mean, it's still, it's still ongoing, I, I suggest, but it's one that you found in different places across campus. It wasn't just in one place, um, which I think is important for the entire university experience. And you chose to stay another year, which I think says something as well, and get involved in another part of the, of the university. What did it mean to be asked to write the article? Were you, were you surprised? Yeah, I mean, it definitely was a very chance encounter. And then it was also uh, really interesting because the, the Kyle that I think you really knew freshman year was much different than the one that I had my senior year too. So that was um, kind of cool. But my, my roommate, Nick, is here and he's teaching a first year writing class. And I was and I was telling him to get his get his freshmen like fired up about their creative writing assignment. Basically, what I told him is, you got I haven't written something creative in a long time. Like, there's not a ton of chances that you get to write about anything that you want and know someone's gonna read it and really care about it. But I, I got fired up for that and I started to look at my personal <laughs> statement for law school a little differently. <laughs> but I think that that's kind of what I why I was so thankful to be able to write this kind of article. I mean, one, like, getting to be published is a really cool, cool thing and a really awesome thing that you were able to do for me. But also just having the chance to reflect on something that was super important to me, mm -hmm. kind of formalize it in words, and then be able to share that story, I think, is uh, awesome. Because there's not a lot of, there's not always a lot of chances where you get to share your story and you know people are going are gonna to hear it. So now that I have a captive audience here, there's a couple stories I want to tell as well. Yeah, so that's definitely what I think. So I think this is, is particularly important because another article in this particular issue is Father Michael Himes' piece that talks about being reflective, being attentive, and being loving. He's, he's who we model that on. But most importantly, he says, give it away. And so this is an opportunity for you to give it away. Just one, you'll have lots of opportunities, I'm sure, in this life to give it away but this has been a beautiful example of you giving it away. Um, and so I'm happy you're in conversation with me today about it. One of the things I think a lot of our, our students would love to hear more about is, is this joy you talk about. And it is very much related to your faith and your faith experience here. Can you talk a little bit about this joy that we all need more of? Yeah, I mean, I, I can try. One thing about Father Michael Himes, uh, so I, I'm pretty sure his article is taken from a homily at the at a, at a mass he gave, and I think it's page eight if I remember. Very, very good, very, very like strong. But then the one line that always that really sat with me was um, the value of your education at BC. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, is not how much better it makes your life, but it can only be measured in how many lives you make better because of your education. And then the last line of his article is, give it away, and the it is your education. And he says, not everybody gets to go to BC, but you can still go share what you learned here and make the lives of those people who didn't get to go better. So that was, that was good. And in terms of, of joy, I think that one, one story that I did, definitely did want to talk about, and I think it combines the two things we're talking about, is I used to, well, I'm, I'm going to start doing it now again, but uh, last semester I started uh, volunteering in, um, prison and prison ministry and that was just probably the most formative experience of my life ever and I think that part of BC's mission is kind of formation through service to others and I think that that's definitely um, something that I took a, took away from this but in terms of, of joy there was there's this one 
one man that really stood out that I met there, and we're gonna call him uh, Jesse because I don't want to uh, <laughs> say anyone's name. And Jesse, when I met him, was 34 years into a life sentence with no chance of parole. And he'd been sentenced when he was 19 years old. And, um, you know, he could really, like, he suffered. And, oh, the most important part is that he maintained his innocence throughout this. And, you know, he suffered and he felt that the, the world took so much from him. And, you know, despite it all, and, you know, he could have been there like, why, God? Like, why did you let this happen to me? Like, I did nothing wrong. I tried to live my best life for you. And now you're going to take it all away from me. But that wasn't, that wasn't Jesse's outlook at all. I mean, so while he was in prison, he taught himself the guitar. And uh, every time that I went in there, like he would start it off with like a, like, a, like a gospel song before we'd start our Bible study. And his favorite one that he, that, that he played all the time, that I don't know, what a, I don't totally remember the words, uh, I don't totally remember the name of the song, but the, the words of the chorus were, this is the day the Lord has made, rejoice and be glad. 34 years into a life sentence. That's just a radical joy. And he totally decided to transcend his cell and the physical confinements and, and live a full life, even when it's almost like so much of the world tried to stop him from being able to do that. And, you know, what he taught me about, like, carrying my life with joy is uh, something that I don't know that I ever live up to, but I try to every day. And, you know, super, super powerful story. And before, I guess I'll, I'll change subjects now to what this taught me about myself a little bit more. So anyways, Jesse, awesome guy. Like, love them. And whenever I would tell people about my prison ministry experience, I would normally talk about Jesse. And that was because what I would tell myself, and there was, there was a lot of other men in that, in, that, in that prison that I think really took ownership of their sin and then dedicated their, lives, their lives to, um, to living better ones and trying to make up for the mistake that they made. And, but I would talk about Jesse because I think it was always easier for me to kind of show the power of faith through someone that was innocent and chose to live joyfully anyway. And I remember um, one time I was in that uh, prison and somebody said Jesse's last name. So when I went home that day, I, I Googled the name and I read the case. And I read, and I read the case hoping to find, like, oh my gosh, how could they have voted to convict? Like, there's no, I was hoping to find like a major hole in the argument or, or something that, and you know, it just never came. I never found it and it became a lot more difficult for me to believe in uh, Jesse's innocence. And I don't know, I thought that really, really shook me and I was thinking about not going into the prison anymore because I almost didn't know why I was doing it and there was so much of the story that I was telling other people and also telling myself kind of went away when I, when I read that. And then I kind of had to take stock and I was like, why am I going to prison in the first place. Like, why was I interacting with, with him with such kindness and such love? Was it because of his acts? Was it because of, like, the way that he took the other men under his wing and kind of, like, helped them really look at their lives in a new way? Or was it because he was a human being? And that's what that meant to me is that why am I, and I think that was kind of where I really understood what it meant to be loving. It's just to kind of carry yourself away and treat people with such a dignity and respect because they're humans, not because of anything that they do for you or bad for you. Everyone's like, I don't mean to make it too like Catholic, but everyone's a beloved child of God no matter where they are in life. And that I think is what a radical love is for other people, is to treat them with that love because they're people, not because of the things they do. And I think that's really what um, the rest of that story with uh, 
with Jesse, I think that's like the lasting impact that it gave to me. And it really made me kind of examine like, who am I being kind to? And am I being kind to them because they're good to me or am I being kind to them because I'm trying to be kind? So I think, I don't know, Jesse had been judged by the world for 34 years and he didn't need another judge. He needed somebody to go in there and, and really become his friend. And I think that that is really the, the most important part of the story. And then, and then to finish Jesse's story, because we're on a, on a cliffhanger and I don't need to go on too long. I think it was January 11th, 2024, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts decided a new case, it's the Mattis case, that um, emerging adults, that's people from the age of 18 to 21 are no longer allowed to be uh, convicted to life without parole. And I think it's a, like a neuroscience thing because of the developing brain. And then Jesse for 30 years had um, been praying for a miracle and then it came and then wow. And then so over the, over the last summer I worked at the Committee for Public Counsel Services and I met a couple of the lawyers that wrote an, an amicus brief, so they're not the, the main party, but a, a brief in support of the Mattis case. And I met people that touched the man that I really knew well, that really touched his life. And that to me was kind of a sign of what I have to do with my gifts. Kyle, I have to say that I don't think I had you wrong freshman year. <laughs> I think you've just become more of who you already were. And it's wonderful to see as a faculty member. So what are your hopes for the future? You're studying for the LSAT year, law school, this prison um, tutoring has been really formative, your BC education, what are, what are your hopes for the future? So, you know, I, I wish that I had a better answer for this question. <laughs> and I think that this is also kind of part of what I wanna give today, is that no matter what kind of job you have or role you have, and I think that this is, I don't know, now that I'm in the Carroll School, I've felt this bias. <laughs> I've, um, but I think no matter what kind of role you're serving in like the big structure and whatever your job is, you can still really be loving and touch other lives in every single one of those, one of those roles. And I don't think that, and obviously, Vocations are very important. The people that give their lives to the public good are just incredible. Um, and that's, this is not to discourage that, and I think it should only be to encourage that, but that's not, not everybody can do that. And uh, I think that even if you find yourself in a role that maybe isn't touching lives the way you thought it was going to, you still touch lives nonetheless. It's the way that you carry yourself and your disposition to the world that you kind of make an intentional decision in every interaction, like, I'm going to be kind today. And I think that that's something that you have, no matter what you have. So in terms of what I want to be, a kind person is more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. And everybody that's gone to law school has told me that you don't know what law you're going to do until you're in law school. So it's, it's tough to uh, decide that now. But I definitely think um, in the long term, I'd like to work in a, like a indigent defense and maybe in a post-convictions unit as well. In the shorter term, I think there might be other paths that I, that I pursue first, but I think that that kind of choice is not me giving up on the being loving dream, it's, or me delaying it, I think that you're loving throughout. Thank you. So over the past few weeks since we've launched the magazine, we've spoken to faculty, we've spoken to students, we've spoken to administrators, this is Parents Weekend, so do you have any advice for parents uh, who are, you know, kind of far away but always very close to their Boston College student? Do you have any advice for them as they make their way on their journey here? Advice for parents? See, that's a role I haven't done yet. So, um, I, um, From the student perspective. <laughs> I, think, um, I think for parents of freshmen, it's definitely going to be something interesting, but you, you have to uh, realize that whatever your, your freshman's doing, especially this weekend, they're putting on a show for you. And they're really trying to show you that they're having a good time and that 
that they're everything. And I think for the parents, the key is to uh, not be judgmental with their student. And I don't know. Yeah, actually, I do have a better answer for this now. And then throughout their whole BC career, I think understanding the mission of Boston College, that it is not necessarily a school that's just preparing you to go work a job, but it's also a school that's trying to form you as a person and make you like a, a better person as you go approach the world. I think understanding that that's why your students here is something that's really important. And I don't know, so when I, when I first started to uh, volunteer in that prison, my mom was so mad at me. She, <laughs> she was so like nervous about me going, and I really understood it too, because I was nervous too, but I couldn't show her that, because then she wouldn't let me go. And I think just kind of understanding that this is the time for your student to put their self out there and experience the world in new ways and, and do different things, like go on a service trip to Ecuador or, or take their spring break on a different kind of uh, service trip or volunteer in a prison or whatever it is, or declare a philosophy major. I think kind of putting trust in BC and trust in your student that they're, they know what's best for their life and kind of trusting them to go and take that action, I think is the most important thing that they can do. Can I have everyone join in thanking Kyle, both for his article and for his <laughs>